When you see news about the discovery of the second Earth or Earth's twin, you might initially think of something like this, or at least something like this. But the planet scientists found may actually look, let's say, like this. But what is usually meant in those cases is that it is a rocky planet that is similar to Earth in size and it is in a so-called habitable zone and also it receives similar amount of energy from its parent star. Good examples would be the planet TOY 700D or Kepler 1649C. The planet, according to scientists, is only 6% larger than Earth. It is likely in a habitable zone, which means it's not too far from and not too close to its star. So liquid water could exist on its surface, which is essential for life as we know it. And also it receives only 25% less energy from its star than Earth from the Sun. Judging by only those parameters, you might think that there is at least a chance that a planet could have conditions necessary for life and who knows, maybe life itself. But there is a little problem. And it's not the fact that planets I've mentioned orbit red dwarfs. Though types of stars are obviously also important. The thing is that we know very little about the actual conditions on those planets and parameters of their atmospheres, magnetic fields and so on can drastically affect conditions, which is not surprising. The system that we know the most of is, well, our own solar system. Let's first look at the habitable zone of our own solar system. Obviously, Earth is well inside the zone. But also, according to this NASA image, Venus and Mars are either at its edge or very close to it. And we have to remember that this zone is actually very loose. We have three planets that are either inside or really close to a habitable zone. But there is only one habitable planet – Earth. At least as far as we know. More than that, neither Mars nor Venus have liquid water on their surfaces. Again, as far as we know. Conditions on those three planets are drastically different. From immense atmospheric pressure and temperatures on Venus to the cold desert of Mars. And all that's in the vicinity of a habitable zone. That shows us that the distance from the parent star is not the only defining factor. And now it's difficult to say what the actual conditions on the rocky exoplanets are. Today I want to talk about the difference between these three planets and focus specifically on one important aspect their atmospheres. You may often hear that the powerful magnetic field of our planet protects us, and without it solar wind would erode our atmosphere and life would be impossible. But also some people might ask, wait, Venus doesn't have a strong magnetic field, and not only it has an atmosphere, the atmospheric pressure at the surface is 92 times the Earth's pressure at the sea level. So what's the deal? Why did Venus not lose its atmosphere without a strong magnetic field? Well, it's not that simple. Three planets and three very different fates. How do planets even lose atmospheres? Why Mars did lose it and Venus did not? What types of processes are there? Is the magnetic field actually that important? So let's talk about all this and more. And my name is Andre, and this is Cosmos Elementary. Very often the fact that a planet might lose its atmosphere is mentioned in the context of magnetic fields and solar winds. Earth has a magnetic field and an atmosphere. Mars doesn't have a global magnetic field and its atmosphere is mostly gone. But that doesn't mean that solar wind is the only thing that makes atmosphere escape. And a magnetic field is the only barrier to that. Usually it is mentioned while talking about the importance of the magnetic field, but there are way more processes in which planet might lose its atmosphere. For instance, there's also a process of photo evaporation, but I'll get back to that. And whilst having a strong magnetic field, even Earth still constantly loses atmosphere. Let's first, at a very basic level, figure out why atmospheres escape to space or why they don't. Conspiracy theorists argue that if everything works according to conventional science and our planet is in the vacuum of space, we shouldn't have an atmosphere. Because if we have two vessels, one with gas and the other with vacuum, and then we connect them, the gas would rush to the second vessel until pressure equalizes. So why isn't the atmosphere doing the same? They say it proves that we live under the dome. Yeah, they forget an important thing. At a planetary scale, the atmosphere is affected by the planet's gravity. The atmosphere doesn't instantly fly away into space for the same reason we don't. The planet gravitationally attracts us and to leave we need to achieve a certain velocity. How fast the planet is losing its atmosphere depends on several factors. 
It is the distance to the star, atmosphere's chemical composition, conditions on a planet, properties of the magnetic field, planet's mass, and so on. If we want to overcome gravitational attraction of a planet, we need to accelerate a spacecraft to the escape velocity. And it is the case not only for spacecraft, but for atmospheric particles as well. Particles of the atmosphere are constantly moving and if one particle happens to achieve the escape velocity, and it is also at an altitude where particles don't collide very often, such a particle can escape to space, while other particles that don't move that fast are held by the planet's gravity, but also they can gain speed via various processes. There are two main groups of processes, thermal and non-thermal. Let's begin with thermal processes. The temperature basically describes how fast particles in a volume of gas are moving. The higher the speed of molecules, the higher the temperature. So if an atmosphere warms up, the speed of particles increases and they can start escaping to space more easily. One of the thermal processes is Jeans escape in the name of James Jeans, who was first to describe it. When we talk about the temperature of a gas, we usually use some average value for the whole volume. Of course, not all of the particles in that volume have the same velocity, and they can also collide with each other, exchanging energy. Some molecules can have higher than average velocities and reach escape velocity, but those particles also have to reach the zone with lower gas density. Let's use Earth as an example. The upper layers are the thermosphere and the exosphere, with its lower border known as the exobase. In the thermosphere here, the molecules can still collide with each other quite frequently, and even if a single particle achieves the escape velocity, it can still remain this layer because of constant collisions. And yet, from time to time, some of the particles manage to escape the layer and turn out in the exosphere, the uppermost layer of the atmosphere. If those particles are not fast enough, they fall back. But if they are, they can escape the planet's gravity once and for all. How fast the planet loses its atmosphere via this process depends on temperature and also on the planet's mass. The more massive the planet, the stronger its gravity and the higher velocity particles need to escape. And the mass of the particles themselves is also important. The more massive molecules move slowlier and they require more energy to accelerate to needed velocities. Hydrogen is the easiest to escape this way, and Earth, Mars and Titan lose hydrogen in this manner. There is also a hydrodynamic thermal process. If extreme ultraviolet or X-ray radiation warms the upper atmosphere significantly enough, it starts expanding. There appears pressure gradient and that results in an upward stream. Molecules accelerate, achieve escape velocity and leak to space. In this case, the atmosphere acts as a fluid and lighter molecules can drag heavier ones. This process can be active on relatively small Earth-like planets with hydrogen-rich atmospheres, as well as on hot Jupiters. This process can be way more effective than Jeans escape. I've talked about two processes and you might have noticed that I didn't mention solar wind. Even a planet with a strong magnetic field can lose its atmosphere via processes I just talked about. Now let's briefly touch on non-thermal processes. Photochemical processes also can make atmospheres escape, when photons coming from a star react with atmospheric particles and that can give particles enough energy to overcome planet's gravity. For instance, neutral particles can be broken apart by ultraviolet radiation, and then resulting particles recombine with electrons and form a fast neutral particle. This is one of the ways Mars loses carbon, hydrogen and nitrogen. Also, particles can exchange the charge and that can accelerate them. Where a magnetic field becomes important is processes in which the atmosphere loses ions. So particles are ionized in the process of photoionization and in the process of charge exchange. Ions have a charge and the particles of the solar wind do too. If a planet has a weak or no magnetic field, solar wind can directly interact with charged particles in the atmosphere, giving them enough speed to escape. Particles that are moving not up, but rather down, trigger another process called sputtering. Those particles interact with other particles and basically knock them out, helping them to escape. These are the processes people have in mind when talking about protective qualities of our magnetic field. Earth is mostly protected from those effects. But on Venus and Mars, where there is no strong magnetic field, solar wind directly interacts with upper layers of their atmospheres, 
So solar wind basically blows those layers away. During solar storms, when solar wind is way more intense, Mars starts losing more of its atmosphere. What is interesting is that sometimes magnetic fields can help atmospheres escape as a result of a so-called polar wind. In the polar regions, protons escape to space along the magnetic field lines, where they are picked up by the solar wind. And those, of course, are not all of the known processes and not all of the details. That's a table from one of the papers I used as a source. And we can see how many processes there are. And here we can see not all of them involve magnetic fields and the solar wind. So yes, magnetic field is important. It does protect us from some of the effects. But even Earth still loses its atmosphere via other processes. By the way, there is also an impact scenario. A large body can collide with the planet and that can evaporate a large portion of an atmosphere into space. Well, not just atmosphere, a portion of the planet itself as well. A moon can form and stuff. And now let's use all of what we've learned so far and figure out why there is such a big difference between Mars, Earth and Venus. So why, while both Mars and Venus lack strong magnetic field, the first one did lose most of its atmosphere and the second one did not? The most simple answer is mass. Venus is more than 7.5 times more massive than Mars. As we figured out, it's all about the escape velocity of particles. For Venus, it's about 10.4 km per second. Whereas for Mars, it's only about 5 km per second. So on Mars, you need less energy to accelerate particles to the escape velocity. Mars's gravity is too weak and it more easily loses its atmosphere. But at the same time, Venus is much closer to the Sun. It is a subject of a denser solar wind. It warms up more. Well, it's not that simple again. Actually, it's not quite correct to say that Venus does not have a magnetic field. Sure, it doesn't have a strong global magnetic field generated in its core, but it still has some magnetic field, more specifically an induced magnetic field. Extreme UV light coming from the Sun ionizes atmospheric particles of the day side of the planet, thus forming an ionosphere. Charged particles get generate an electric field and thus a magnetic field. And when magnetic fields and charged particles of the solar wind interact with those fields in the ionosphere, they produce an induced magnetic field. Venus does have some magnetic field after all, and it even has some familiar features like a bow shock or a tail. Still on Venus, the solar wind reaches deeper and interacts directly with the atmosphere, but there is at least some protection from the solar wind. There is something similar even on Mars, but the atmosphere is less dense there and the planet is farther from the Sun. Mars also has small local magnetized regions. Perhaps the rocks were magnetized when Mars still had a global magnetic field. Yet, that didn't really help Mars. So, okay, when we compare Venus to Mars, it's more or less clear. Venus is more massive, it has at least some of the magnetic field, but why does Venus have a hundred times denser atmosphere than the Earth? One important factor is water. Not all of the atmospheres are equal. Sure, they are necessary to support life, but what is also important is their composition and density. Our atmosphere is mostly nitrogen and oxygen. On Venus, 96.5% of its massive atmosphere is CO2. What is interesting is that Earth probably used to have a similar amount of CO2, but where did it all go? Um, this time, not to space. For instance, it went here into limestone. CO2 can be removed from an atmosphere and it requires liquid water, which absorbs it and there in the process of chemical reactions, limestone is formed. Because Earth held on its oceans, most of the CO2 is in the limestone. As we know, Venus doesn't have oceans and probably no liquid water on its surface at all. Venus might have had oceans billions of years ago, but then something went wrong. A runaway greenhouse effect. We won't go into too much detail here, but what is important is that the runaway greenhouse effect and a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere eventually led to blazing hot temperatures on Venus we see today. On Earth, water is mostly on the surface and in the lower atmosphere. Water molecules are much heavier than hydrogen and it's not easy to lose water to space. But in the heat of Venus, oceans probably evaporated. Water could get high enough for the solar radiation to start breaking water molecules down and it is way easier to lose hydrogen. And with no hydrogen, there is no water. So Venus lost most of its water. Without it, CO2 couldn't be removed from the atmosphere and that's why it remained there. 
As a result, in spite of the fact that both Earth and Venus lose their atmospheres at about the same rate, Venus's atmosphere is still almost a hundred times denser. But denser obviously doesn't mean better. Our less dense atmosphere with its properties allows life to exist. So all planets lose atmospheres. Via different processes, they lose different components. We can see that it's not as simple as just looking at how far the planet is from the star. There are lots of factors. We need to take all that into account when we try to evaluate the habitability of exoplanets. Both Mars and Venus don't have internal magnetic fields. Both of their atmospheres consist mostly of CO2, and yet one lost almost all of its atmosphere and became a freezing desert, while the other managed to hold on its atmosphere, which made it a lifeless hell. And in between there is Earth, with its magnetic field protecting us from some of the processes that make planets lose atmospheres. We've got oceans that remove most of the CO2 and we don't have a runaway greenhouse effect. At least for now. Thanks for watching. Links to all of the sources are as usual down below in the description. And if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, comment and subscribe not to miss new videos. Bye.